Let's talk about the settings on your ABG result. So let's say we do have an SIMV of 16 and everything else, as I said, and the, and the ABG comes back with a pH of 7.5 alkalosis and a CO2 of 28 alkalosis. The patient's in a respiratory alkalosis. Bicarbs 25 and the O2 sat is 92% with a PaO2 of 84. Not bad. I mean, the oxygenation is not bad. But let's think about that respiratory alkalosis for a minute. What is it that causes respiratory alkalosis? Well, remember that CO2 is a measure of alveolar ventilation. Well, here we are mechanically ventilating somebody. CO2 being 20 times more diffusible across a membrane is going to be influenced by how much ventilation is going on. So when your patient on a mechanical ventilator starts to show signs of alveolar hyperventilation, CO2 dry, driven down, What's the maneuver that's necessary? Now, mind you, this is not done independently. So changing ventilator settings is not an independent nursing action. It's a collaborative one, but nonetheless, you may have to prompt that change. So the answer is that it's the respiratory rate. So the number of breaths that the patient's being delivered per minute is too many because we're putting them into an alveolar hyperventilation. We're putting them into a respiratory alkalosis. That's the only thing you touch. You never touch the tidal volumes. You only decrease the respiratory rate. You don't touch the FiO2 or the PEEP unless you're trying to improve oxygenation, like we said. So let's give a reverse example. Let's say that with a given number of given settings that the pH came back uh, 7.26 and the CO2 is 50. And all else is, all else is unchanged. That's a respiratory acidosis, and you need to increase the number of breaths delivered. It's not sufficient to normalize your uh, respiratory system's um, ventilation. It's not sufficient ventilation. Okay. Let's go on to look at really the third mode that we didn't mention yet. This third mode is called BiPAP, a BiPAP maneuver. So BiPAP really is a combination of what's called CPAP and pressure support. So CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure and PS stands for Pressure Support. So what does that mean? It means that you don't need to deliver any breaths to the patient. So the patient's not getting this preset tidal volume. And the FiO2 may be left alone, but instead of PEEP, now we're calling it CPAP. So really CPAP is PEEP for patients that are breathing spontaneously. So what does that do for gas exchange? It improves it. What does it do to the functional residual capacity? It increases it. What does it do for gas diffusion? It improves it. So this is a great thing for weaning because we can make sure they're oxygenated. What's pressure support? Well, pressure support provides a little oomph um for that patient with ventilation. In other words, when they take a breath in, they're going to get this positive wind that helps them take that breath. What, is it, what does it do? It decreases the work of breathing. So CPAP and pressure support are like hardcore weaning maneuvers. Like, okay, let's take away everything, but we're gonna be nice and give them CPAP and pressure support. Keep the endial tracheal tube in, because sometimes there's what's called weaning trials, where you do this for a period, well, let's give them a break for a few hours and put them back on ISAMD. So all that is determined by the patient's ability to sustain ventilation, and that's all gonna be on a pretty wide continuum. Let's talk about high pressure and low pressure alarm limits. Very important from the nursing care standpoint. These are set so that we know when the pressure in the airway, that's going directly to our patient's airway, by the way. So airway, we know immediately that this is you know, a high priority intervention. It exceeds what we set it at. So what type of problems or issues could cause that? Well, something simple like the patient's biting, you know, the ventilator tubing, something simple like all this tubing is filled with secretions and there's an obstruction. So if you can immediately identify why this high pressure alarm limit is going off, the more better. You just, you know, um, treat accordingly. Do you sedate the patient when they're biting? 
that's a judgment. You have to see, is it, you know, is it indeed agitation or is there something else that's making them agitated? You, first, you make sure that all their parameters are healthy, their arterial blood gas, their O2 saturation, and indeed is just you know, blocking of the tubing, then you proceed accordingly. Other things that cause high pressure alarm limit is something like barotrauma. If you cause a pneumothorax with those positive pressures being you know, forced basically into your airway, then you're gonna have full resistance of the air that's trying to go into that airway. So that's another you know, huge implication for, whoa, okay, so discontinue, bag the patient, and of course, go through steps to treat the pneumothorax. Let's talk about low pressure alarm limit. So this is when the lowest pressure that it, that it should take to deliver that breath has not even been achieved. So that low pressure alarm just like, like the air just went like everywhere. There's no pressure, there's, no, um, there's nothing to overcome in order to deliver a breath to the patient. That's not normal either. So things that would cause a low pressure alarm limit would be things like you know discontinued from the ventilator, really common, or would be, would be a little more serious is that there would be a hole in the ventilator tubing or something wrong with the circuit. So if you don't know immediately, just like with the high pressure, if you don't know immediately with either one, either one of these alarms, you immediately discontinue them. Now this is the universal adapter for the patient's endotracheal tube. Disconnect it and manually ventilate the patient with a bag valve and mask. What do we set these numbers at as far as CPAP and pressure support? Um, CPAP, the numbers coincide pretty closely to what appropriate PEEP numbers would be. So, you know, you could see a CPAP of five centimeters of water pressure. You could see pressure supports not really parallel to anything, but let's say 10 centimeters of pressure that's delivered uh, upon inspiration, remember, decreasing that work of breathing. Let's talk about some other implications, you know, patients with this tubing, this tubing could be a real reservoir for bacterial growth. So you never um, empty the contents of this tubing back into the humidifier. Obviously you don't empty it back into the patient's airway. Respiratory therapists do come and help maintain this tubing. That's really the focus of, of their job, of their role when you have a patient on the ventilator is really to focus on the ventilator. So that's very collaborative whereas your focus is the patient. Okay, endotracheal tube, I just did a little cartoon one. If you have an opportunity to look at an endotracheal tube that's not inserted in a patient, you, you should see it so you know how long it is. So it's the length of the mouth to really two to three centimeters above the bifurcation of the trachea. So that's the appropriate placement. And your responsibility at the bedside is to ensure that you know exactly where that endotracheal tube sits at the lip. So there are little numbers here, so it could be like 26 centimeters at the lip. And you'd mark that down as part of your doc documentation. Why is that important? Well, let's say you have to reintubate somebody. Let's say the endotracheal tube moves or gets dislodged. You want to know exactly where it was when it was properly placed. Other responsibilities is to you know, realize that there is this cuff that is inflated in the trachea to ensure that no secretions go down into the lung. And it is the respiratory therapist's role to ensure that that, that pressure of the cuff doesn't exceed capillary perfusion pressure. In other words, doesn't you know, cross the airway. It's their responsibility to make sure that indeed there is air in that cuff and you would know that because this little pilot balloon that's attached to the ventilator by a string is going to have air in it. It doesn't tell you how much air when air is in that little balloon but it tells you that air is in it. Well other ways that you would know if that um, cuff is not appropriate is because your low pressure alarm limit might go off so those alarms are very important the fact that they're set and the fact that you're taking um, paying attention to them. Also remember the ventilator does the same thing our upper airway does in that it warms the air so it's got a thermometer here that makes sure that the air is not cold air going into the patient. It humidifies the air so they're not getting dry air so their airway doesn't get dry and it does filter the air because that's what our upper airway does. So the ventilator is maintained by respiratory therapy and they ensure that those numbers are where they're supposed to be. You confer with them about your views on how the patient is tolerating the settings as provided. 
but really these settings are what you need to be hardcore familiar with and not too much beyond that depending on how um, specialized that that you are in a setting where a ventilator is used. Uh, 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 uh.